Interestingly enough, uh, five and a half years after I became a Christian, I actually went uh, to seminary. Um, and uh, like everyone that was in my particular program, uh, I had to take beginning Greek, uh, which the upperclassmen called baby Greek in order, in order to humiliate uh, the underclassmen. Uh, but it was beginning Greek. And, but once you had a little bit under your belt and once you, know, you had kind of some of the basics down, uh, one of the first books that they have you actually translate is the book of First John. And he said, well, why is that? Well, for one thing, it's short. You know, I don't want to give us anything too big to start off with. Uh, but also because the Greek in First John is relatively simple. Uh, the vocabulary is really modest, uh, maybe a couple hundred words. Uh, the syntax, sentence structure uh, isn't particularly complicated. Uh, the irony, though, is this. While the translation of 1 John is relatively easy, the interpretation of it can be relatively hard. In other words, 1 John is, uh, is you know, the first book you translate, and they say it's the last book you should try to teach. And I almost made it. I almost made it without having to teach 1 John. But Mr. Smarty Pants, Mr. Dr. Edwards, you know, uh, said we should teach 1 John. And so here, you know, I got it. I'm teaching 1 John. Um, and, and so what's interesting is what uh, Spurgeon said of the Bible is true of 1 John. It is shallow enough for a child to wade in, uh, but deep enough to drown an elephant. And this morning, uh, we come to the deep elephant drowning end of the pool uh, in 1 John chapter 5. And we're picking things up. I want you to look just at verse, verse 6 first. And you just see where we're going with this. Where John says, This is the one who came by water and blood, Jesus Christ. He did not come by water only, but by water and blood. And it is the Spirit who testifies because the Spirit is truth. Now, I don't know about you, but that sounds deep. Uh, Alfred Plummer, uh, in his commentary, called this the most perplexing passage in the epistle. This is the toughest verse, toughest verses. And he says, and one of the most perplexing in the New Testament. Lucky me, right? <laughs> and I'd be really upset about that, except that Matt has to deal uh, with uh, the sin that leads to death next week. And so we're going to find out about that. And we'll leave that to him. Uh, but to begin to understand uh, what John is saying, it's helpful to remember where, where we left off. Look at verses 4 and 5, verses that we looked at actually last week, where John says, For everyone born of God overcomes the world, and this is the victory that has overcome the world, even our faith. Who is it that overcomes the world? Only the one who believes that Jesus is the Son of God. And John, if you've been with us, you know, he's been telling us about a way of life uh, that works. God has this way of life for us that works. Uh, a way of life uh, that, you know, not only uh, can withstand, but can actually overcome anything that this sin-sick, uh, sorry world can throw at us. But it starts with faith. Uh, it starts by believing that Jesus is the Son of God. But that, in turn, begs a question. How do we know that Jesus is the Son of God and everything that follows from that? And his point will be that God himself has testified or borne witness uh, and, and said that Jesus is my Son. So if we reject Jesus, we're, we're, we're not just rejecting the message of an apostle or a, a preacher, we're actually rejecting the message of God himself. And the flip side of that, of course, is the gospel. Uh, if we accept Jesus, then we're believing the message of God himself. But he says all this in a, in a very strange way that's kind of cryptic to us, but it was probably clear to his, his readers. And uh, let's just take a look at it again. In verse 6, he says, This is the one who came by water and blood, Jesus Christ. He did not come by water only, but by water and blood. And it is the Spirit who testifies, because the Spirit is truth. Did you get all that? I mean, it came by water. I mean, does that mean he came by boat? What's he, what in the world is he talking about? And then what's up with the blood? What's that about? Well, maybe what he says next will help. Look at verse 7 and 8. For there are three that testify, the Spirit, the water, and the blood, and the three are in agreement. About what? Okay, that doesn't really help. 
How about verse 9? Maybe, maybe this will help. He says, we accept human testimony, but God's testimony is greater because it is the testimony of God which he has given about his son. Okay, now, you know, the silt is beginning to settle a little bit. Uh, if someone gives an eyewitness testimony, we believe them, right? Uh, especially if, it's two, if there are two or three witnesses. If someone says, you know, I saw something or I was there, you know, unless there's some compelling reason not to, we, gen we generally uh, take them at their word. And what he's starting to say is if we, be, if we take people at their word, especially on the basis of two or three witnesses, if God himself says it was this way, well, we can and we should believe it. Okay, so I, I get that. But why in the world is he even bringing all this up? Verse 10. Whoever believes in the Son of God accepts this testimony. Whoever does not believe God has made him out to be a liar because they have not believed the testimony that God has given about his Son. Well, what has God said? Help me with this. We'll look at verses 11 and 12. And this is the testimony God has given us, eternal life, and this life is in his Son. And whoever has the Son has life, and whoever does not have the Son does not have life. In other words, if God speaks it, we believe it more than if a man speaks it. And God, in fact, has given his, this testimony. Jesus uh, is his Son, and the person who believes in him has the life that he gives, and the person who doesn't believe that Jesus is the Son of God doesn't have the life he gives. So that's pretty clear. But where did God speak? See, I, I'm drowning here. I mean, earlier he said that God had spoken through the water, the blood, and the Spirit. And you go, okay, what in the world could he possibly be talking about? And as you can imagine, uh, there's been all kinds of different ideas down uh, through the century. Uh, some are, look at this and they think of uh, John uh, 19, verse uh, 34, and I'll put this up for you. I remember, Jesus is on the cross, and you remember when the soldiers uh, thrust the spear uh, into his side and out came blood and water, and there's the verse. One of the soldiers pierced Jesus' side with a spear, bringing a sudden flow of blood and water. There's our words. You know, just, just reverse. So maybe that's what it's referring to. And some have thought that. Now, that is not an incidental detail, uh, by the way. It's an indicator of death. Uh, when it means that Jesus' heart had stopped and fluid began to fill up his lungs and, and the sac, the pericardium, around the heart. And when that spear went in, out came the water and the blood. And it means that Jesus actually died. In other words, uh, he didn't just faint, he didn't just pass out on the cross, and then, you know, they put him in the tomb, and he rested up for a few days, then he came out and convinced everybody that he was the Lord of Lords and King of Kings. He actually died on the cross, and he really rose from the grave. So that's an important, uh, important fact, but that's not what this, uh, is ref John is referring to in 1 John. Others, uh, Calvin, uh, believed th that this was referring to the sacraments of of uh, baptism in the Lord's Supper. I mean, you got the water, and you got the, the blood. You got baptism and the water, and then blood symbolizing the Lord's Supper. One little problem with that is it only mentions one of the two elements in the Lord's Supper. What about the, the body? And the problem, uh, bottom line, is that neither view really fits the context. So what in the world is he talking about? Well, as it turns out, these two words, water and blood, are kind of uh, ancient shorthand. Uh, they're kind of code words that John's readers would have understood. Uh, meaning what? Well, meaning the water uh, probably would have brought to mind baptism, but not the sacrament of baptism. It would have brought to mind uh, the baptism of Jesus. Remember when Jesus was baptized, when he came up out of the water, a voice came out of heaven and said, this is my beloved what, son, right, in whom I am well pleased. What was that? Well, it was God's testimony. The father bearing witness to the identity of Jesus as his son. This is my son. Okay, what, well, what about the blood? Well, that probably refers... Uh, that's probably a reference to what they would have picked up on as the crucifixion. Uh, what did God do at the crucifixion? Well, the moment Jesus died, he said, it is finished. And what happened? 
Well, we're told that there was an earthquake, and then there was, remember the curtain that was in the temple, in the Holy of Holies, this massive curtain that sort of divided up the temple uh, into two parts, and the high priest once a year would go and make a sacrifice before God uh, behind the curtain, and they had very, very strict rules about approaching God. And at the death of Jesus, guess what was torn apart? The curtain. Torn uh, from top to bottom uh, by the finger of God, signifying a new era when all people, not just the priests, had direct access to God. And so so when Jesus' blood was shed, when he died on the cross, the Father was saying in dramatic fashion, it is finished. This is my son. He paid the price for the sins of humanity, and I'm declaring him to be my son in that. So you have... This testimony at the beginning of Jesus' ministry, his baptism, and then you have the testimony at the end of his life, at his death. But then there's the Spirit. What's that about? Well, when When Jesus Jesus was was baptized and he began his ministry, who came upon him as a witness? It was worse than the first service, actually. I was going to have to take my shirt off. It was really scary. And then, and then this, is, this is actually Matt's microphone that I'm wearing this morning. So if this sermon tanks, just blame it on Matt. Right? It's his microphone. Sorry. What was I saying? Oh, yes. Uh, the Holy Spirit uh, came upon Jesus when he was being baptized. And then who did Jesus promise to be in us and to bear testimony and work in us after he left? Again, it's the Holy Spirit. And, and so, so what John seems to be saying, uh, in a way that's kind of foreign to us, but would have been uh, familiar to his, his readers, is this. If we accept human testimony at face value, how much more can we accept the testimony and trust the, the testimony of God? God was a witness, has borne witness at Jesus' baptism and at his death. And then when, someone, when we, uh, someone steps across the line from unbelief to faith, God's spirit begins to work from the inside out in that life and, in that life and begins to change it. And again, that's the testimony of God. So you have the water and the blood and the spirit. And that's my interpretation of the passage, and I'm going to stick with it. You can disagree. You'll find out when you're wrong when you get to heaven. But <laughs> there it is. That's, that's what we think. That's our best guess. You have the testimony of God himself about the identity of Jesus. But here's why it's important. Look at verses 11 and 12. And this is the testimony God has given us, eternal life. And this life is in his Son. And whoever has the life, has has the Son, has life. And whoever does not have the Son of God, does not have life. Now, if John has been kind of cryptic and somewhat complicated up to this point, this is pretty clear. The testimony testimony ultimately concerns the assurance of salvation, and the heart of it lies in the fact that eternal life is found in Jesus as the Son of God. And that's what we want to talk about now for the balance of our time. And to start, I want to talk about this whole idea of eternal life. Now, when we think of eternal life, what what do we, most of us think about, we think about heaven, right? Eternal life. We think about heaven. Uh, We think of the life that lasts forever, but after we die, right? Uh, Years ago, uh, on a London London churchyard, uh, there was a grave that had a tombstone that had had these words written on it. Uh, The suspicion it must have been an overworked mom that had this epitaph. Weep not for me, friends, though death do us sever. I'm going to do nothing forever and ever. Right? Some, uh, some students in Southern California at, uh, at Vanguard uh, University uh, would sometimes go to door to door and they would talk to people about their faith and uh, you know, just knock on the door kind of, kind of randomly. And one time they came to a door, rang a bell, a woman answered. She was a mom. She was, a, this was not a good time. She had a vacuum cleaner in one hand. She had a baby in the other. There was a child crying in another room. Something, you know, clearly was burning on the stove. Another kid was uh, running with a crayon, marking up the walls. The phone was ringing. The television was blaring. And so that was the scene. When the door opened to them, uh, when she opened the door to them, they said, ma'am, are you interested in eternal life? 
And she answered, frankly, I don't think I could stand it. <laughs> but that's not what was in the mind of Jesus, primarily, and, and the New Testament writers. You see, when we hear eternal life, we think primarily about, like, quantity of life. Length of life, this life that's going to, you know, extend out forever. But they were primarily thinking about quality of life. See, we think of the future life that we're going to have after we die. They're thinking about the life we have with God that starts now and lasts forever. See the difference? It's an important distinction. It has significant ramifications. Uh, Dallas Willard, uh, head of the philosophy department uh, at uh, USC for a number of years, uh, and a believer, which just boggles the mind that uh, evangelical Christian, the head of the department at USC, but he made a very strange comment uh, just before he died this past year of pancreatic cancer. He, this is what he said. I think that when I die, It might be some time until I know it. I think that when I die, it might be some time until I know it. What a strange comment. But you understand the idea. Just walking with God, and you just keep walking with God. But it kind of explains it. In another place, he writes this. Jesus made a special point of saying those who rely on him and have received the kind of life that flows in him. I love the the language of that. Have received the kind of life that flows in him and in God will never experience death. Jesus shows his apprentices how to live in light of the fact that they will never stop living. You see, there is actually a danger in thinking of eternal life as something that's only in the future, as something that's only down the road. Because if we do, then we're going to miss out on the life that God has for us now. Eternal life is the life that starts the instant you cross the line from unbelief to faith by making that decision deep down the level of the soul to follow Jesus. And then it lasts forever. And when we understand that, it changes everything. And in fact, in a lot of places uh, in the New Testament, um, you don't even see the word eternal life. You just see the word life. It doesn't even mention the eternal part of things. Uh, and in fact, again, just like uh, John has done all the way through this letter, he's, he's no doubt reaching back to things that Jesus said. I want to put up a, a verse for you. This is uh, very near the end of the Gospel of John, John 20, verse 31. Where John said, these things are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God. Sounds very similar to what he's been saying, right? In 1 John. And that by believing, you may have life in his name. And the life he refers to is the quality of life we have in Jesus, the life we have when we believe that Jesus is the Son of God. And without that life, you simply continue in death. And it's the life you want. And it's the life that John has been talking about all the way through this little letter. Uh, It's It's a a life life lived under the umbrella of God's love and grace where our sins have been forgiven. Remember what John said in 1 John 1, 9? If we confess our sins, he is faithful and righteous to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. That's true every day, but it's also true uh, at our conversion. We're forgiven when we we come to God and confess our need. Uh, Steve Brown, uh, a number of years ago, told this story. Uh, apparently this was in the, new, in the newspaper and it was about a man who he said was cleaning the john he was cleaning the toilet at his house and it blew up apparently and he was cleaning away 
and the phone rang, and he went to answer it, and there was this gigantic explosion in his toilet. And when he was uh, describing it later, he said, it was like a hand grenade in the toilet. And they asked the University of Miami professor what caused it, and he had mixed Comet and Santa Flush together. And apparently, there's something in those chemicals that are kind of dangerous. And uh, Steve Brown says, I'm warning you guys, don't mix Comet and Santa Flush. You know, we don't need you to get blown up. And he said, the other interesting thing is that when we got to the phone, nobody was there. We were, you know, called him away from the phone. But but this this is what he says. That's what the gospel is like. He says, it's like a hand grenade in a toilet. He says, it really is. He says, listen. It's, it's like, like God, God coming, coming in, in with Comet and Santa Flush in a supernatural <laughs> burst of power and excitement and reality in the midst of the darkness and the dirt of the world. But they also says, God doesn't just clean the toilet. He gives us brand new porcelain. That's what we get. So in this life, for the forgiveness of our sins, we live under grace. I mean, and it gives you a, a peace and a joy that, you know, you don't have enough money to buy. So life living under the umbrella of God's love and grace. John has said that. Uh, it's also uh, the, life, the life that God gives places you in his family, uh, in his family. John has said this a number of different ways all through the little letter. As followers of Jesus, uh, we have a relationship, he says, with our Heavenly Father. And because we're related to him, we're related to each other. Uh, remember what John said? How great is the love of the Father has lavished on us that we should be called children of God, and that's what we are. And in this life, you're in a family uh, with other brothers and sisters in Christ. That means you don't have to go it alone. Uh, that's where you, you have a family, where your life matters, where you're loved and you love others, where you can find a friend and you can be a friend. Uh, in God's family, uh, you get to be a part of something bigger than yourself. You get to be a car, part of you know, all the brothers and sisters, all the entire church, the community, the entire family of God, and everything that they're doing in the world. You know, we're just one little piece of the puzzle, but we get to be a part of that, that big thing that God is doing. And therefore, it's a life of meaning and significance and purpose. So the, it's, it's a life of forgiveness and grace. It's a life where you're in a family, meaning of, and where you have a life of meaning, significance, and purpose. But there's one other thing. The life God gives is a life of transformation and change. Uh, Remember we said this, we talked about this a a number of weeks ago. Uh, John didn't put it exactly like this, but we're kind of like frogs, remember, Uh, living under a curse that need to be rescued, delivered, and changed. And John says, in a sense, we've been kissed by God and we've been transformed into a prince. And all through the little letters, he's kind of saying, uh, you know, um, if, if you're not being transformed, uh, those transformation, if there's no change in your life, then you really have to ask the question, am I a Christian? You see, Jesus uh, is in the life-changing business. And from, from the very beginning, it was kind of a strange thing. People would come to him from every walk of life, every you know, set of circumstances that you could even begin to imagine. Sometimes satisfied people, sometimes messed up people, sometimes lepers and injured people, sometimes forgotten people, despised people, prostitutes, tax collectors, all kinds of sinners, admired people, wealthy people, religious leaders. And they would all come to Jesus and then there's something about him that they would just cave in. Their hearts would just cave in. And they were born again. There was an article uh, this past week in the uh, News Tribune. Uh, after the first service, a number of you actually did, people did see this and know what I was talking about. Um, it was on the opinion page. It was on the editorial page. Um, and the heading of the article is Redemption Begins. And it's guy, uh, by a guy by the name of uh, Michael Gerson, uh, who writes for the Washington Post. And I've got to be really careful here, uh, because what this is about a certain political candidate, who should go unnamed, uh, who is criticizing and questioning the conversion experience of another political candidate. And I'm not going to name any names. And if you figure it out, 
Don't write me any emails or anything. Just keep it to yourself and don't shout out any names. Uh, but he writes about it, about this, this, this one particular uh, political uh, candidate who is, who is questioning the conversion story of another candidate. Um, and that he went from a troublemaker to a Christian. And uh, he said, this one political candidate said, it's just so much crap. And I'm so glad Walker said that in first service because you, now I know you can use that word in church. That's what he said. And he goes in, he goes in, he's talking about this other candidate. He goes into the bathroom for a couple hours and he comes out and now he's religious. Give me a break. It doesn't happen that way. He said. And this is what Gerson says, Michael Gerson. Well, he says in Christian history, it has often happened that way. Remember, this is, a, this is a Washington Post article. In Christian history, it has often happened that way. Around 35 AD, a nasty character named Saul got knocked from and to his ass on the road to Damascus. Don't send me emails. I'm just, just reading here. I'm just reading. On the road to Damascus and became utterly trans, the utterly transformed Apostle Paul. In 386 A.D., Augustine heard a child's voice chanting, Take up and read, opened a Bible, and randomly, uh, randomly to Paul's letter to the Romans, was convinced to the core and abandoned the life of a hard-partying pagan. Around 1510, a monk, now you're going from hard-partying pagan to a monk. Around 1510, a monk named Martha Luther, Martin Luther understood Paul's letter in a new way. One version locates this revelation uh, in a bathroom. And I felt I was altogether born again and had entered paradise itself through open gates. On May 24, 1738, John Wesley heard something, someone reading Luther's preface to the Epistle of Romans in a meeting at Aldersgate, and at 8.45 p.m. felt his heart strangely warm. He says, but this is not really a matter, a uh, political matter uh, at all, demonstrated by another conversion. Bob Beckel, and I don't know who he was either, but I know some of you do. Bob Beckel was famously uh, Walter Mondale's campaign manager in a 49 state loss. Uh, he was a trusted fixer at the State Department and White House, and then a progressive TV commentator. Though, most, uh, though through most of, his, uh, of this, he was also an alcoholic, a drug abuser, and a womanizer who kept hitting rock bottom only to find new bottoms beneath. We know this from Beckel's transparent and compulsively readable autobiography. I should be dead, my life surviving politics, TV, and addiction. He gained his survival skills from dealing with an alcoholic and abusive father. I learned how to wear a mask at all times and reveal my true feelings to no one. Later on, this led to a bifurcated life, uh, mornings at the White House, evenings in dive bars and brothels, a ferocious political ambition and a tendency towards self-destruction. Professionally, Beckel managed an impressive feat, becoming the political dirty trickster for President Jimmy Carter, who abhorred dirty tricks. In pursuit of, pass of passage of the Panama Canal Treaty, Beckel ran a rogue operation involving opposition research, tilted polling, visits to Mama's health spa, and political back blackmail. Seldom has a boring, respectable objective has a, a seedier backstory. Beckel was also in and out of Alcoholics Anonymous for years, trying to recover without uh, buying into the higher power portion of the 12 steps. When George W. Bush prevailed in the election crisis of 2000, Beckel, by his own account, began losing contact with reality. On the eve of the inauguration, he found himself in a bar with a woman and then her jealous husband pointing a 45 at Beckel's face. The gun misfired. The next day, he watched the inaugural parade from a room at the George Washington University Hospital Psychiatric Ward. He says, and Gerson says, the whole story is really worth reading. But through the intervention of friends, particularly columnist Cal Thomas, who's Christian, to whom the book is dedicated, and after some brutally honest self-examination, 
something decisively changed. After resisting a potentially lethal drink, Beckel sat weeping on a rock in the middle of a field, and I knew, he writes, there was a force that had wanted me not to do that, a force that loved me enough to stop me in my tracks and redirect my steps, that loved me, me, he says. If there is one moment I can point to, a moment when the idea of God's grace shifted from some kind of abstract concept to being something flesh and blood, something rich and meaty, something real, that was it. And then Gerson goes on to say this. Conversion in the Christian tradition requires the recognition of sin and failure which is the only way the offer of grace makes sense. He says, this is a difficult concept for many of us to accept. But voices as diverse as, and he mentions one of the candidates' name, and Beckel, promise something encouraging that at any moment, early or late, can mark the beginning of hope. In this life that flows from Jesus, we're forgiven and we walk in grace. We have a new family, brothers and sisters in Christ, where we are loved and together we make a difference in the world. It's a life of hope and the promise of change. And it's a life that starts now and lasts forever. But here's the deal. You have a life, and you have to choose a life. You have a decision to make about the testimony of God, about his son, and the life he, did, uh, he lived, and the death that he died, and the death that he defeated. And if you've never made that decision, here's the invitation. Jesus has been changing lives for 2,000 years. And if you would like to make that decision today and receive the life that Jesus has, I would love, absolutely love, to talk with you about that. And you can do that before you leave this place this morning. Well, let's stand now uh, for our time of response. This is where we decide what we're going to do with what we've heard.